שלום לכם. תארו לכם שהיה קו סיוע לייעוץ מדעי לתסריטאים ובמאים. תארו לכם שהם יכלו להרים טלפון ולשאול אם זה הגיוני שהאקלים של כדור הארץ ייהרס בתוך שבוע, שהגיבור יראה וירוס עובר מוטציות מתחת למיקרוסקופ, או יציל מישהו שנפל לתוך חור שחור. או פשוט כדי לברר מה העוצמה של הוריקן על המאדים. אז להוליווד יש כזה קו סיוע, והוא נקרא The Science and Entertainment Exchange, וכדי לשמוע עוד על היוזמה הגאונית הזו, נפנה אל אנד מרצ'נט, מהאקדמיית הלאומיות למדעים, הנדסה ורפואה של ארצות הברית. וכדי שנוכל לשוחח, אני אעבור עכשיו לאנגלית. שלום ובוקר טוב לאנד מרצ'נט, מהאופיס של קומיוניקציה של ה-US National Academy of Science, Engineering and Medicine, שהוא מלווה את ה-Science and Entertainment Exchange. תודה רבה שאתם מתכוונים, אנד. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be able to talk to you about this. So how did the National Academy came up with this service? <laughs> It's not intuitive. I mean, it doesn't sound like something. The National Academy of Sciences goes to Hollywood. Um, but, you know, I think that we clearly recognized that there were many audiences out there who were not reading the reports that were issued by our institution. How can that, that be? <laughs> I know, it just seems crazy to believe it, but it's true. And so we, we felt that there, we had to investigate other avenues to communicate to a much broader audience. And we also recognized that some of the best communicators in the world were in Hollywood, that people willingly go and, and consume the, the communications that are written by the very talented writers and the very talented producers and directors who send stories out into the world from Hollywood and so we thought if we could make a connection with them that that might be to our benefit and to the benefit of the viewing public and I will say that this was not a brand new idea we did not invent the idea of communicating through film and television there was a fairly deep literature base that helped guide us and so this this is something the Academy would not do just because they would think it's a, kind of a cool idea to go to Hollywood. So we spent a lot of time looking at the literature to more completely understand the way in which we could communicate through the mechanism of film and television. But is it really important to get science right on a blockbuster movie? I mean, it's not like we believe the hero can take down an army of Nazi aliens while armed only with a sword. So who cares about the scientific accuracy there? Well, you know, we, we actually don't use the word accuracy all that much. We're pretty careful to stay away from that. If we had gone to Hollywood and positioned ourselves as the accuracy police, I'm pretty sure that nobody would talk to us. And in fact, I think that was one of the things that we recognized going into this that had been the mistake of people who had tried this previously, that they had gone in there saying, it's so important that we get the science right, that we get it accurate. And so we were very careful not to use that word. If we did use words, maybe plausible is a better word to use, that the plausibility patrol might be better than the accuracy police. And, and I think that if, if you also go in saying, you know, we, we want to make a better offer, you know, that you have to have a conversation. It's a bit like improv, that there is no, no, but there's yes. And, and mm -hmm. so we recognize that when we have these conversations with members of the entertainment community, you, you can't just say, well, that would never happen. That's not correct. That's not accurate. It's more, it, it, it's more advantageous to us to say, well, that's interesting. But you know what else you could do and just make a better offer. And I think from our point of view, audiences don't always need it to be accurate. For we want more science and better characterization of scientists and of engineers in film and television. Most people can distinguish the fact that this is entertainment. It's not a documentary. It's, it's a story. But if they are hooked, if they can get enough good science and enough interesting portrayals of scientists, that's enough to incent them to go learn more from more reputable sources. Mm -hmm. So it isn't that we always want the, the, you know, the, the, the science to be completely right in there, but just make sure there's more science and more great science characters. So how does the service actually work? What do you do? 
So there's two ways that we do this. One I would characterize as more reactive and one more proactive. So the more reactive side of it is kind of like the 1-800, I need a scientist. Although that's too many digits and you can't dial it. Uh, <laughs> but there is a an actual toll-free number and it's 844-NEED-SIDE. So if you need a side, that's what you do. You call that number and you, if you're a writer, a director, a producer, anybody who is creating content for film or television and you have a question and you know you may just start by saying well what does somebody wear or we've been asked questions like um if somebody were to rip out someone's tongue with a pair of pliers how long would it take for them to die and how much blood would be in their stomach when they did the autopsy yes i mean you know we get asked these kinds of questions <laughs> And we answer them. And sometimes they don't know what they don't know. They think that scientists are polymaths, you know, that they can ask a question about biological evolution and structural engineering and get one person to answer that question. So we have to parse through, you know, tell us what your questions are, and then we'll go ahead and find the experts. And then we reach out through our network of scientists and engineers mm -hmm. and public health professionals and find somebody to answer the questions for them. So that's the very reactive side. But we quickly realized that we're just going to be asked a lot of questions about black holes and murder. Like that's, that's kind of where Hollywood goes. Right. And so we wanted them to ask questions about things that they didn't know about. And it's hard to ask a question where you don't know anything about it. Mm -hmm. So then we do a lot of events and we put scientists and science in front of them that they've never heard of previously. Mm -hmm. They're not going to ask a question about the microbiome if they've never heard of the microbiome. Mm -hmm. And so we put somebody out there to talk about that. And so we do a lot of really interesting events with great communicators in science because Hollywood doesn't have the only great communicators. It's not true that scientists are not good communicators. And, and then we get, and then that generates more questions and more interest um, in, in new topics. And it also provides us with a way to put interesting people in front of that. Them. Not all scientists are old white men. Thank you very much. I was just about to ask specifically about that. So apart from getting the content right or not right, plausible, do you strive to also influence other aspects of the representation of science and scientists? Yes, that's a really big part of what we do. We really focus on the representation of the scientist and not just to make them the the, the good guy, um, you know, because you do want the scientist to be the hero and, and that's a good thing, but also to be not just a guy, um, to be a woman, to be a person of color, not always to be older. Um, when, when we think about how we influence that, again, it's not just telling Hollywood, you shouldn't do this. It's, it's better for the world that you, that you depict characters in a more um, interesting fashion. That doesn't work, you know? Hollywood does things because they're trying to make money. So instead, we put people in front of them that do not fit the mold and that are just naturally interesting. And as our writers have told us, well, how can I get those people out of my head now? And so we conduct tours. We've taken people to labs and they'll look around and they'll say, well, who's that young person over there with the pink hair, that young girl with the pink hair sticking up? Well, she's She's actually an aerospace engineer, a rocket scientist. And then we saw a character written in a television show, a young woman with pink hair standing up who was a rocket scientist. And as the showrunner told us, well, I couldn't get her out of my head. How, how can I write a different character now? Well, Anne, thank you so much for this fabulous conversation. Uh, and please join us for another conversation on other creative engagement endeavors that you're involved Absolutely. in. Absolutely. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you.